So hi, Emily. How are you doing? It's been a while since we last spoke. <laughs> yes, I know. It's it. It feels like ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. It, just a couple of days ago, I, I I read this. Uh, somebody posted on on social on a social network something that said uh, I've lived uh, through like uh, four decades, and it was something like uh, 1980, 1990, uh, 2010s, and then they said March and April. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess for context, I met you in December. Oh my gosh, so long ago, December of 2018. Um, yeah when I, I went down uh, to Google, uh, the Mexico City office, and we ran a Google GeoTools workshop. And then last year, last December in Colombia, where we brought the Google Earth education experts together. And I'll talk a little bit about um, that community uh, later on in the presentation. But hello, everyone. My name is Emily. I am a program manager uh, working on the Google Earth outreach team, and I focus all of my time on education. I've been with Google ah, almost 10 years. Uh, it's coming up in July, and the entire time I've been working on what we know as a product area, what we call Geo. Um, so Geo is all of our location-based services. So everything from Google mobile maps to our satellite imagery, so ground to the cloud, anytime you touch a surface or look for a location or even search for a location, that is fun with my team. And uh, today, uh, Fede invited me to talk a little bit about uh, our tools, how we're thinking about COVID-19, distance learning, and some of the things that we're doing in response. Um, I can say a lot changes every single day at Google. So this is the most up-to-date information that I have and that I can share. No, please feel free to ask plenty of questions. And of course, I'm, I'm happy to visit again. Um, so with that, let's just go ahead and dive right in. So hopefully everyone knows Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it as universally accessible, universally useful and accessible as possible. And when we think about the world's information, pretty much every single thing that we search for or want to understand has a location component. And so very early in the days of Google, uh, the, the engineers and leaders decided to invest an incredible amount of engineering power, resources, money to map the world and make it as accurate as possible. So anytime that you search or uh, use a Google search, um, that you can get the information that's locally relevant to you and, and that you can navigate and explore and understand as much of the world as possible. And right now, uh, we have over 200 countries and territories mapped in the world. We have now, I believe, 2 billion people using Google Maps on a daily basis. And we have driving directions that span now 150 miles or 150 trips to the moon and back. Um, it's, I guess, around 50 million miles at this point of, of driving directions. And so when you think about how much is invested just in the base map itself, you really understand that at a Google scale, we have a lot of opportunity to share that information and think about ways in, um, in how we can improve the livelihood and environment for everyone using our, our maps data. Um, and then we also think a lot about how you know, depending on where you are in the world, your experience with the map is very different. So if you're walking around in an incredibly busy city like Bogota or Mexico City, that's entirely different if you are in um, rural parts of the Amazon. And so understanding the different ways in which we experience location and place is really critical. And so that brings me to the team that I work on. Internally, we're known as Geo for Everyone. Um, and I work on a smaller subset of that, and that is the uh, Google Earth Outreach team. And the way we kind of break down our work is essentially how can we use our mapping tools and geodata um, for societal and environmental benefit? How can we make these tools really improve the livelihoods of everyone around us? And so our focus is uh, on the societal end 
come in a number of different ways. Uh, first and foremost, Plus Codes is a, a tool that we're working on to help map out places that are incredibly rural or just difficult to map or just aren't represented on government databases. And so Plus Codes right now in, in the age of COVID-19 is so critical. Um, so when we think of favelas or barrios throughout Latin America or slums in India or really rural uh, environments such as the Navajo reservations in the United States. Um, all these populations need care. They need COVID-19 attention and they need information. But if they're not on a map, it's really hard for uh, medical responders, emergency responders, or for kind of governments at large to respond to those populations because they're not actually mapped. And so Plus Codes is working on giving everyone a uh, lat long um, to help with those critical issues. We also think about accessibility. So if you have a, a disability or a handicap, how are you navigating in the world around you? So you can imagine if you're someone who's blind or has hearing disabilities, your experience of navigating through city is very different gender equity and equality, making sure that our maps and map results reflect um, the way in which you want to live in the world. And then what's critically important right now is crisis response. So before, during, and after any sort of crisis, where, whether it's natural disaster or in this case, pandemic, how can maps help make our lives more useful? And then on, on the environmental end, we have so much data that can inform scientists, researchers, city planners on how to create healthier environments in cities and across the world. And so we have our environmental insights platform uh, where you may have seen um, evidence of air quality, uh, carbon emissions, um, deforestation, reforestation, and other kind of environmental triggers that we are monitoring and trying to share with the entire world. And all this kind of boils down into the tools that we utilize to help kind of up level our mission. And GMM stands for Google Mobile Maps. Sorry, I should have changed that. So just in your back pocket, what everyone is carrying around nowadays, how are your mobile maps assisting you? And then what we call the Earth Suite, the tools that I really think about on a daily basis are Earth Engine, our geospatial uh, planetary data analysis platform, Google Earth, both our web-based version and pro, and then Earth Studio, which is our web animator. Um, and so when we take a step back and we look at how are we trying to improve the world, how are we really trying to move the dial in terms of societal and environmental impact, I always have to remind the leaders on our team and um, this is what Google for Education does, is 20% of the world's population is currently in primary or secondary education. That is a huge number of people who, uh, kids who are currently in an educational environment. And so where can we have the most impact when it comes to the future? That really boils down to our, our youth. And that boils down to my work and what I spend a lot of time thinking about is how can I make these tools as usefully accessible, education focused and available as possible for all of you educators out there. So our mission is ultimately to empower students with social and environmental knowledge to influence and activate positive change for future generations. So on a, a macro level, how can we create you know, the next generation or current generation of students who are really passionate about the planet Earth, where they live and how they can contribute positively to the environments around them. And what's even more powerful is that all subject matters, everything that we, we teach and we share with students and kids can be taught through the lens uh, using Google Geo tools. So whether it's exploring art, architecture, a whole wide range of social studies, that's accessible through Google Arts and Culture and Maps and Earth. Um, there's so much geographic data that is really critical to understand. And we're mapping out layers and um, just thinking about how our tools can be more easily applied um, in K-12 environments. 
you can explore the world and really get a sense of what is happening around you and outside you. I always go back to, you know, when I was in school, we'd have those physical globes and I'd love spinning and playing with them and thinking about all the different places to go. And, you know, before there was Google, you would search, uh, you would play with your, your globe and then you'd go to your physical encyclopedia or book and then learn about those places. But now it's really all contained, um, which on some levels can be frustrating for educators, but on in other ways, it's very, very powerful that students today have that access. And then um, with all of you and with the Google Earth education experts, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to be in a position where we can actually influence how we're building these products and building these tools to really empower students. Um, because if all of these world problems that we're facing today have a location related component, we should empower students today to understand how they can use these tools to make informed decisions about the future. Uh, and so what I do at Google is run our Google Earth Education Program, which is a combination of outreach and training. So working directly with educators such as yourselves, nonprofits, scientists and researchers and thinking about how we can use these tools, creating online resources and activities, um, which we recognize right now is highly critical in a distance learning environment, working with uh, curriculum partners and subject matter experts. I always like to say, you know, Google, yes, we, we are a wonderful search indice and yes, uh, we have access to a lot of information, but we're generally not the subject matter expert. And when it comes to earth and education, I really wanna make sure that the people with the actual knowledge and the pedagogy are in place to really up-level our tools. So they're um, good for classroom and learning environments. Uh, and then, of course, we work very closely with our engineering and product teams to understand the needs of all of you. But my program really holds a, a huge thanks to our Google Earth education expert team. Fede is one of them. He is not in this picture. Uh, the Google Earth education experts program started approximately three years ago. And now we're going through some transitions, uh, but these are really our, our trusted teachers out in the field who know what is happening in classrooms, understand the geo tools better than anyone else. And so while most of them are Google certified trainers or Google certified teachers, uh, the Google Earth education experts have an up-leveled knowledge of, of geo and, and the resources that, that we have way above and beyond your classic Google uh, for Education trainer. And so anytime you're looking for a resource or assistance or want to un better understand how you can use our tools in the classroom, I would definitely lean on the GE3 who are running these sessions now. Um, so let's get dive right into COVID-19. I'm actually an, an aunt to eight nieces and nephews um, who over the past few weeks, month, they've all transitioned to distance learning. I also have a, a sister who works in special education um, and now spends most of her time meeting online uh, with parents um, to kind of help them create strategies to modify coursework and ensure that technology isn't hindering academic progress, but is actually supplemental. Um, I also have three family members who are, are physicians. And so I'm very, very much aware of what is happening um, with the coronavirus, at least in, in my personal family. But we know it really acutely affects kids and the impact on education is, is profound. Um, so this information is from UNESCO. Over 1.5 billion learners have been impacted by COVID-19. Um, of course, this data is a little suspect because it's so hard to understand what is happening across education um, without kind of governmental oversight. And that only goes so far. But 91.3% of total enrolled learners are impacted and then 188 countrywide closures, which I actually believe um, that that 
number has gone up since um, I last looked at this data. And so, you know, second to healthcare workers, um, education is truly taking a, a enormous hit. And so um, we've really redirected our, our attention to think about how to um, help respond to the, the pandemic and um, again, be, be useful and helpful and not a hindrance. Um, and what's really also profound is that educators everywhere are really rising to the challenge to, to teach remotely or to not even teach remotely, but just adjust learning at an unprecedented scale. And of course, parents are putting in so much extra time and work uh, to create productive learning sessions. So kudos to all of you. Um, keep it up. And hopefully some of what I share today will help in the process. Um, so one thing that we can very definitively say, maps are critical in a crisis. And so already my team, um, we have very much the lens of, of crisis response. And so it's something that we actively deal with on a daily basis, but nothing to the scale of, of COVID-19. Um, but what's wonderful is wonderful and terrible, but what's wonderful is that you can actually take a lot of the information that we're using as adults and as just trying to understand and interpret the world and use that information to share with your children um, and, and your students. And a number of different ways in which we see our maps and, and data being used right now, which can support conversation is, you know, first and foremost, just in your phone. Um, when you're doing searches for businesses or pharmacies or hospitals, thinking about, well, what is the critical information that you need right now? Um, and, and that's something that we're actively working on here at Google. One of our big projects is, is blood drives. You know, after we get through this first pass of COVID-19, how can we help people go and um, give blood donations and help with serums and antibodies? But you could easily sit down and have a talk with your, your students or have them think about what is the information they would want to see on their phone in terms of crisis response or in terms of understanding how and where to go right now in the world. Uh, we also see a ton of different journalists using uh, my maps to quickly and accurately um, measure COVID, um, COVID cases. And then I'm sure many of you have seen in, in the last few weeks, Google and Apple joined together to look at how we can use our, our data location on our mobile phones um, to look at mobility changes, but also to report COVID cases. And so this is a, an opportunity to think about one, digital literacy, understanding where's our digital footprint in the world, you know, how, how can we think about privacy and data and helpful and critical practices? Um, why is this information helpful? But also what do we need to be aware of? And so these uh, mobility changes, um, particularly for middle school and high school students, it's a great dialogue to think about how the world's changing and, and what are the metrics that we need to understand to kind of pick up a and resume to a normal pace. And so what I like to think about uh, right now is in the in this world of COVID-19 and and just distance learning, how can we really empower kids right now or these future generations who are going to emerge and take on these challenges in a big way? Uh, how can they become data analysts, reporters, and change agents? Um, and I think with with Google Geo technology, we can really start training them and give them access and information to allow that uh, activity to happen. But it really only comes from educators such as yourselves who are excited about the technology, want to dive into it, get a little messy at times, um, and be open to the the questions that your your students pose. And so I'm going to focus primarily on two of our tools uh, and examples today, uh, My Maps and Earth. And you're welcome to ask questions why. Um, but with My Maps, 
So I like to call it a next generation doc, similar to, to Google Earth. Hopefully you're all familiar with my maps. You can easily collaborate with others. You can edit an Android, import a lot of different data sets and spreadsheets, stylize your, your map very easily, annotate, embed, and share. And so these two examples that I'm going to show you aren't specifically COVID related, but something that I'm working on right now is essentially creating a toolkit for classrooms to understand how they can create these maps on their own um, remotely. So this first map, uh, my map that I'm showing you, uh, is called the Stasmus Stored Places Digital Atlas. And this was a research project originally started with uh, the Stasmus First Nation based in Canada, in Ladysmith, so far Western Canada, uh, working with the First Nation population and then youth of the population where they were essentially instructed to do a digital storytelling project and essentially go out and ask their elders to record protected uh, sacred spaces, protected locations, and how the elders experience their land um, over, over the course of time. This research project ran over the course of five different years, um, high process on, uh, easy process in terms of getting kids excited about uh, taking videos of their elders, looking at um, places, but really bringing the elders to these locations via via maps. And then ultimately the output was a mind map where community members could go in, listen to the names of these places, the stories from the elders via their computers, laptops, and mobile devices. Um, but what's wonderful is this is really a, a youth-driven activity where they created their own icons, they created their own videos, they did the, the interviews themselves and really just had someone kind of help collate and bring everything together. And so you can imagine, actually going back to this, um, so one thing that is going to be promoted during Earth Week um, is essentially sharing that love of location and thinking about climate change. And one way to kind of process change over time is for students to actually go back and ask the elders and their family how their community and environment has changed over the course of their life. And can you go into Earth or can you take photographs or go even into Street View and see those changes over time. Um, and so this is just a wonderful way, one, to bridge dialogue and kind of connect historical time to now. Uh, but secondly, it's something that you can easily do online and does not require actually traveling to those places. And something very similar, um, this is a, a my map, uh, Stories That Move, that was created in order to help engage youth um, and share their stories about racism and discrimination um, across Europe. And so this comes out of the Anne Frank Foundation. Uh, and it was inspired by a, an international youth meeting in Berlin 2013, where a huge, I believe, close to 100 experts from 14 different countries came together to talk about how to address race and discrimination with youth. And it really came out is that youth really just want to hear from each other. Uh, and so this map is a, my map, um, allows you to upload and share their own videos and recordings of what is happening in their particular neighborhood and um, share positive experiences but also those of exclusion, discrimination, and hate crimes. And so right now, when you're thinking about your students who are all isolated, a mind map is a wonderful and protected way of sharing what is happening in, in their local communities uh, with other students. So if you have a sister classroom somewhere in the world or looking for other students to kind of connect with, mind maps is a very, very easy way to do that. Um, and so just a few, why am I really highlighting my maps right now instead of the whole host of other geo tools is first and foremost, it's embeddable. And I know that when we're thinking about Google Classroom sites, 
uh, activities right now. Students really need to have their own agency and be able to share directly with their peers and their parents. And my maps is truly the simplest way to do it. Uh, you can also import massive data sets and um, host KML and create a lot of different mashups. And so, and then last but not least, it's it's not, uh, it doesn't take a ton of bandwidth. It's, it's very um, uh, light bandwidth heavy, which I think is critical when we're considering distance learners competing for that Wi-Fi access. And there's just so much opportunity in the way that you can take a mad map and make it into whatever you want in a collaborative way. The other main tool that I think about and, and focus on a daily basis is our web-based version of Google Earth, which launched back in April of 2017. Hopefully everyone is familiar with, with Earth on the web. It is uh, a mirror of Google Earth Pro, which launched way back in 2006, 2005. Um, but you can fly anywhere in seconds, explore hundreds of 3D cities, right in your browser. It works across all devices. No download is required. There's some um, uh, you know, key differences with our, our desktop version, Google Earth Pro, but we're working actively towards um, you know, true cohesion right now. Um, I'm just gonna assume everyone is familiar with Google Earth. So a few things that we're focusing on right now in terms of Google Earth on the web are prioritizing our content and stories specifically for distance learning. So um, we've immediately launched into new weekly quizzes. So every Monday or Tuesday, when you open up Google Earth, uh, you'll find a new quiz. So that's usually you know five minutes or less, very quick game and activity and something that anyone can pick up and start exploring the world on. We also have a big push on creating more Voyager stories in our education category, which have supplementary resources and activities. Um, this is a very exciting development. We're working on creating YouTube videos of our Voyager stories to increase our offline options and access different types of learners. So you can imagine when you go through a you uh, when you go through a Voyager story right now, you click through the panos and you see the pictures and you see the content. Uh, our our videos are essentially just going to be a vocalized version. So instead of reading that panel on the side, uh, someone will be essentially vocalizing that content. Um, and that will be in, in Spanish as well. We're working and finding new distance learning content partners. And then what's really fun is that back last year before Creation Tools launched, we worked with the GE3 uh, to create teacher authored Voyager stories or what we like to call tabs. Um, and so now I'm encouraging everyone to share their projects via social media or a form that FedE can send out later, um, where we wanna turn your Earth projects into the Voyager stories. And so the critical difference is an Earth project is something that you create, it's your own document stored in your drive, you have sharing permissions and rights, uh, whereas Voyager as a platform we now localize into 10 different languages and it's accessible to everyone in the world. Um, but we love the, the teacher authored content because it is generally very much placed in inquiry and learning. And um, so yes, I, I encourage everyone to create and share and hopefully you will get published on Google. And so that leads right into our Earth projects in general. I don't have great Earth projects to share in terms of COVID-19 responses. Um, our focus has really been putting out content and making things just easy, clickable, no fuss, no muss. We haven't really been trying to talk to parents or teachers or anyone like, okay, let's go through a 10 step plan of of creating an earth project. Um, but once you're ready and and if this fits into kind of your, your workflow right now, uh, we are very much encouraging work, earth projects. 
they're just not embeddable and there are different levels of sharing access. And so that's why I wanted to show my maps first. Um, but with Earth, it's very similar to, to my maps. You can create points, lines, and polygons. The key difference is this is now on a, a 3D platform and you don't have the same ability to import data sets and stylize them as easily on, on my maps. Um, that said, you know, Earth is really our, our platform that we're leaning in on on the future. So everything with my maps and our other geo tools that you experience today ultimately will be on the surface of Earth. And so I highly encourage you to go into Earth and, and start creating projects and start sharing those projects. One, because it might be created into a teacher authored Voyager story. Um, but two, this is really where our, I guess our product direction is going. And so if you, if you want to create a project and know that will last for a really long time and has kind of the legs for, for sharing and visibility, um, I would go with Google Earth. Uh, but so quick activations right now, considering distance learning, um, activity ideas for your students. Everyone can go and take screenshots so you can spell your name in earth art. Um, you can have older, well, young students and older students across the board, just go and find their name in, in satellite imagery. Uh, that also opens up a conversation of how do we get that imagery and what resolution is it at and why are there clouds in certain places of satellite imagery versus not. But essentially go and have them just create their, their own name collage or create collages for family members. Um, stranded on desert island right now in COVID-19, everyone is very focused on what is happening inside their home. Well, take them out of their home. What happens if they were on the other side of the world? How would they, uh, how would they survive? What tools would they need? Get them out of their daily reality to suspend, uh, suspend their disbelief and experience something else. Uh, easy math exercises, working with two dimensional shapes, compare and contrast different global locations, especially if you're encouraging your students to be international pen pals. Uh, there's a lot of activations with earth and imagery that you can utilize. And then a scavenger hunt. Just turn on grid lines in your lat longs and have students go and explore or challenge their peers to discover something fun and nuanced in earth. Um, so yeah, just similarities with my maps and Google Earth. Their web apps. They are both additional services, so they still require a Google account to, to utilize. Um, I didn't talk about Tour Builder, but that is kind of your workaround. If you can't get access to Earth or My Maps, if you're a G Suite school, go ahead and use Tour Builder. Um, it's just, it's similar to Google Earth, similar to My Maps, but doesn't have uh, the additional service constraints. But it's not embeddable and it's similar to Earth in, in terms of sharing. Uh, but your content all stored in cloud, it's associated with your Google account. Uh, and you can mark locations on, on the map, attach your rich media. But my maps is better for mapping and visualizing large collections of, of data sets. So mashing up many different locations, many different ideas, uh, and you can easily import that data and it's embeddable different than Google Earth, which is ideal for a small collection of cations and that are thematically related or tell a narrative story. And it's best for kind of that 3D and immersive imagery experience. And where I would actually go to find what other educators are doing is uh, hopefully <laughs> right now, um, Fede is someone who, who shares wonderfully, but go to social media, look to your peers, I, again, I don't, you know, my my work and what we do here at Google is really to make the best technology and the best platform, but it's all of you. It's our G3 experts. It's people who are actually in classrooms and thinking on a daily basis. 
of what works with their kids that are the experts of how to utilize this technology. And so I always go to social media and discover what other people are doing. Google has also created a number of different education resources, which I'm sure at this point everyone is familiar with, um, but they have uh, created a distance learning hub where you can find plenty of materials across all of the Google and G Suite um, uh, tools to, to assist with distance learning. And those are both for teachers and parents, such as the new Learn at Home Hub. Um, and then there's also the Applied Digital Skills Collection, which if you're new to G Suite resources and Google, you can go and, and get trained up on. Um, but there are also really nice, easy projects that are incorporated into that digital skills collection um, across all different ages of how to help technology essentially skill build for you into the future. So yeah, so just a few resources and Earth and GeoTools are certainly sprinkled throughout all of those different places. Um, but GE3 and social media and coming directly to our Google Earth Education website or Google Google Earth Education website are the best places to go for our tools particularly. If you want to get more involved with our community, please join us. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Google Earth and at Earth Outreach. And we have a, a Google group, um, which Unfortunately, I didn't include on this particular slide, um, but we can include and follow up resources that you are welcome to join. Um, it's just an open community where anyone can kind of post questions, concerns, issues, and either uh, a Googler or a G3 member or just one of um, a, a passionate member of our community will respond to. So I will in my final minutes, open it up to any questions that we have. So uh, yeah, hi Emily. Um, I think it was great everything you were you were showing us, and yeah, the, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, the first one from somebody very close to you, <laughs> Miroslava asks wow. uh, about that map you showed at the beginning, uh, where you're sharing with us. Um, you know. Uh, the, the schools that have been like uh, the quarantines that are taking place, and if it's like a nationwide, yeah, that 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 one. Mm -hmm. uh, she is asking, where could we access this map? Like, do like can we see it? Like, uh, is, is there a link to that map, or or is this just a um... that? Hello, hola, Muros. <laughs> that was created internally. Um, so I don't. Uh, I can follow up and see if there is a publicly accessible uh, visualization that's been created that we use in our own personal personal deck to look at in, impact on education. But uh, let me follow up on that. Okay, great. Uh, the other thing that I, as you were explaining, uh, one, one of the things that I thought was interesting, we have been doing some sessions here and actually on using Google Earth uh, to create projects. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, when you were asking that you were assuming they were familiar, yeah, I think most people have, uh, you know, been part of those sessions. Uh, but uh, I thought that uh, um, something that's interesting when you were talking about how we could use these tools, uh, I remembered um, there's like a Voyager tour on like uh, classrooms around the world where they go mm. and you get to see like different types of classrooms. Let's say how, how a school is looks like in Africa, how it looks like here in Colombia, how it looks like in the States. And and I was thinking just as, as you were mentioning that there's not many projects based on COVID-19 right, right now, it would be interesting to see where quarantine is taking place in different places on earth, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> So something that I'm thinking, let's say, or I've heard people mentioning at times we see celebrities talking about their quarantine and complaining, but they live in huge houses. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's interesting to see, like, you know, there's got to be people who are quarantining in really small places, and maybe we should be grateful that we're not in that type of situation. And maybe it's an interesting thing to understand how, you know, uh, we're all in, the, in a similar situation that's just quarantine, but the, 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 
the setting is not really the same. So I think that would be an interesting project to look at. Yeah. I, I love that. And actually, maybe this is a question that I'll pose to the community. Um, we've been struggling. So I work very closely with the Voyager team, the Voyager layers team. And a question about historical pandemics has been coming up a lot. Like, can we, this is such a, a great time to talk about um, public health, public health mapping, uh, looking at, at epidemics and pandemics. And so people keep saying to me and the Voyager team, well, you should create a pandemic map. And we're all kind of sitting back and saying, well, one, is it the right time? Because this hasn't ended. There's no, yeah, there's no end in sight. And then two, what is creating more anxiety versus less? What is actually helpful in terms of a dialogue? And and so that's something that we've been going back and forth on. And um, I would love, you know, for people to kind of chime in what would be helpful in that sense versus over information because you can find you can find and discover these maps um but yeah so i but i do love this idea of quarantining in place and looking at um yeah just the different ways that people are kind of hunkered down and if we can if we can share that i think we have to get people who are willing to share <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I think it would be interesting to see that, uh, you know. Uh, and there's also probably places where uh, people, even though they're quarantined, uh, maybe they don't have the biggest house, but they probably live like in an outdoors place where, you know, uh, despite that you're in quarantine, you're pretty much way better than a lot of people who have bigger homes. So I think uh, it, it, looking at all these differences and how things are, are not the, usually we, we make assumptions and it's nice to, to go and go like, oh my God, it's not really that way. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so so I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. And, and well, I don't know, maybe we put the idea out there and maybe somebody will jump in and start working on it. The, the nice thing is that these projects are shareable. So, you know, we could actually do something where everybody shares different places and, and we could look into all those ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I think maybe a critical difference is there's nothing stopping anyone from creating these maps. There are different reasons why Google may not be, <laughs> may not be able to. Um, but I, yeah, I, I will definitely ask about that. And don't be surprised now, Fede, if I follow up. <laughs> okay, you're signed up for this. No, that would be that would be great, and and it would be nice if if there's any follow up, we could discuss it here too and let people see that yeah. you know whatever we're coming up here, it, it's working. Uh, we actually do have a, a project uh, with the with uh, pointing the the places where people are presenting from. We haven't included you yet, but we will update it soon. Oh. And and so far we have something like uh, sixty pins or fifty eight pins on the map with people who have in one way or another uh, uh, provided, you know, help uh, either in a session or something here. And, and it's really nice to see that it's a, like a global effort. You know, everybody's chipping yeah. in. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's I, I think if there's one, you know, true positive kind of impact out of COVID-19 is the, the way that education um, the education community is really galvanizing together and thinking about how can we just reach through through the screen, through the monitor, and and have have impact that's meaningful. Um, so yes. Yeah. And people are asking right now if if your presentation, if you is it like a, is it shareable? Like, could you share the link so people could have access to it? Or I've not made it shareable yet, but I will. Okay. Okay, cool. So, so uh, once once you can, maybe if you share it with me, I'll make sure to share it out to people. Yes. Um, no, and and other than that, I don't know, Emily. I think that uh, let's see what other questions we had around here. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people are going back to school today. That's something that we were oh. getting a lot of. <laughs> oh a wow! Lot of, uh, yeah, well, uh, back to distance learning. Let's say because some okay. schools had like a larger break. Uh, and now they're coming back into distance learning. Uh, no, I think uh, there are not, not many more questions, but there is a lot of interest in 
uh, Google Earth. And uh, something that I, I did take a screenshot and I will share it later out with people are your suggestions on uh, how we could use Google Earth in classroom, you know, looking for uh, uh, shapes and using all those ideas. We'll share them out so that people will uh, maybe include it. And something that I also really liked, and, and I always say that <laughs> uh, when I'm talking about Google Earth is how it's not uh, uh, related to any subject. It's related to all of them. So yeah. it, it, whatever takes place, it's taking place on Earth. So, <laughs> so in some yeah. way, we will always relate it to uh, to Earth and, and I think it's cool that we can use uh, Google Earth tools with any subject. So I think that's really cool and, and I'm really happy that, that you had time to join us and it's just been great uh, you know, getting to catch up with you here. <laughs> wow, wonderful to catch up with you. I think my another, you know, my follow up question to your community would be what are the maps that you all want to see and then to um for follow-up presentations what do you want to learn more about or do a deeper dive on okay yeah we'll make sure to ask everybody and find <laughs> out hey, just just so you know uh, this wednesday and, and maybe letting people know uh, miros will be uh, sharing with us a uh, that and Wednesday will be Earth Day. <laughs> so Miros will be sharing with us uh, some projects she's working with Google Earth and that were that are actually now part of the world's largest lesson initiative. Yeah. So so we're really excited to to have her join us and see her take on a uh, Google Earth. And I'm sure that it will inspire many other teachers to go ahead and start, you know using the tools and and i think uh, in a way uh, I, I really like google earth uh, because it, in a way it's always like an eye-opener i don't know uh, we we tend to think very much of our own very own little world and uh, all of a sudden we notice that oh my god there's all these things going on and i think that's something that's really nice about about um, earth projects in general yeah i think well miras's work with world's largest lesson mm -hmm. hopefully will take over the world in the next 18 months you're on the book, Miros. Um, but yeah, I I will end this on saying, you know, Google Earth is just a tool. It's really educators and and the people that take it and and mold it and help shape the, the experience in a way that students interpret it. That's really what makes it sing. We'll always yeah. discover, but having that scaffolding and and context um, makes all the difference. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think you also hit that uh, many times on your uh, presentation. And I think, yeah, the, the, that uh, pedagogical aspect is really important. And I think it's just a, a, well, once again, thank you very much for joining us, Emily. I've invited Lula over. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Emily. Yeah, and no, I think it's great that, that you joined us. Uh, a lot of people are really, you know, interested and and i'm sure that we'll keep working on some google earth sessions and and we'll also be looking into um some tour builder sessions and yeah we're exploring all the tools in general and 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 i think that uh, people uh, will be will, will look at a way to use them in their lessons and i'm guessing your question on hey what do you want uh, how are you going to use this it will help us get more ideas so th thank you very much emily thank you very much okay well, thank you thank you Adiós. Bye. Bye, bye. Hola, Hola Fede, ¿cómo estás? Pues muy bien, muy bien. Aquí que eh, estuvo muy interesante todo lo que nos presentó ahorita Emily de, de Google Earth. Eh, sí, sí lo vi. Eh, y el mapa, bueno, ella va a ver qué tipo de mapa nos pueden compartir más adelante, pero me pareció interesante ese mapa de, de, de cómo se está eh, implementando los diferentes tipos de cuarentena en el mundo, cómo esto está, eh, los colegios, cómo se están cerrando, que, que, que eh, pues está directamente relacionado a los colegios. Entonces, es interesante que información que uno no, 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 no tiene ahorita disponible, pues qué bueno haber podido ver eso. Claro, escuché tu idea también que le propusiste de hacer el mapa para ver cómo lo están viviendo las familias. Digo, aparte sí. de que están en unas casas grandes o chiquitas, la actitud también con la que lo están tomando y la educación, Fede, a lo mejor ver cómo están haciéndole el homeschooling los Exacto. papás a sus hijos, eso estaría súper interesante. Y es, no, y, e interesante ver, por ejemplo, lugares en los que no hay eh, acceso a internet, cómo se está haciendo allá, todo eso son, y son preguntas que nos han estado haciendo en el chat, eh, que nosotros estamos eh, precisamente tratando de, de buscar personas que nos compartan esas experiencias, 
pero, pero sí, yo creo que, que, que interesante que nos damos cuenta que estamos encerrados, pero eh, hay que ver cómo es el encierro en diferentes lugares, qué, qué diferente, lo que dices tú, cómo lo están eh, tomando, ¿no? Porque habrá gente que está feliz en un lugar diminuto y habrá gente que está aburrida en un lugar inmenso. Así es, exactamente, ¿no? Suena muy interesante esa propuesta, va a estar, va a estar muy bien hacerlo. Sí, sí, sí. Y oye, Lula, y te pregunto aquí, ¿tú cómo estás? ¿Te veo con bandera ah, mexicana? Sí, bueno, tengo mi bandera de México acá atrás. Uh. Es un zarape, pero tiene este, la bandera de México. No me lo puse porque hace un calorón aquí que, bueno, ella, a, a, a través de la pantalla va a llegarles el olor al sudor, entonces no. Y, este, y me puse una blusita que compré en la Huasteca, que es la zona en la que vivo. Yo vivo en la Huasteca. Pero según yo, el diseño es como más del sur de, de nuestro país, como de Chiapas o de Yucatán, por ahí. Este, Ay, entonces, pero sí, es, es, el diseño es mexicano. Y ah. en mi nickname puse una nutria, porque aquí en Tampico el lugar es, se llama Tampico, viene del náhuatl que se llama lugar de perros de agua, y los perros de agua son las nutrias de río. Y bueno, y mi bandera de México, por supuesto. Ah, pero tú saca, sacaste todo de una, wow. <risa> claro. No, yo me vine, fue con gorro apenas, pero bueno. Está bien, está bien. Mañana no, no. ponemos la banderita de cada quien en nuestros nicknames. Eso está buena esa idea, sí, yo, a mí no se me ocurrió, pero ahorita actualizo y pongo banderita también, eso está buena, así podemos también proponer a los presentadores y, y nuevamente jugamos con la idea del de planeta y todo eso. Claro, sí, sí, buena idea. Mira, aquí comenta Alejandra de León que le gusta, le encanta tu blusa. No sé ah, si. pues muchas gracias. Me la compré en Huejutla, en, fui a las fiestas de Chantolo, que son Día de Muertos, y, este, y ahí me la compré. Entonces, pueden visitar las fiestas de Chantolo en, en, los, en Día de Muertos para ver ahí todo el mercado que tienen. Y aquí tienes otro comentario que te hace Ana Luisa que dice que más adelante ella espera tener otra sesión de tips cortos y muy útiles como solo tú los haces. Fíjate que estaba, de hecho, luego voy a platicar con Fede para hacer así como que algunas interrupciones a lo largo de las sesiones con un tip corto, este, a ver si, si, si se logra. Yo creo que sí, eh, podemos ya pensar en eso, es que, y, y lo habíamos antes, bueno, yo ahorita voy a presentar, ya arranco en un sí. momentito, pero bueno, eh, eh, a, habíamos contemplado originalmente, eh, ¿te acuerdas? Tener como unos, unos tutoriales cortos así de intermedio, así en es. ese momento la, la, la plataforma permitía unos videos solo de 30 segundos, y, y la verdad es que 30 segundos era bastante difícil dar un tutorial, pero ya ahorita hubo un update que vi este fin de semana, que ahora podemos poner videos hasta de 5 minutos, Ah, súper bien. Ahora sí podemos pensar de pronto en unos tutoriales y de tips así rápidos que, que sean útiles y los podemos ir compartiendo durante las sesiones y yo creo que, que va a ser buena idea y mira que pues Ana Luisa está pendiente de los tips, entonces ahí tenemos una buena oportunidad para compartir. Excelente, eh, me parece eh, muy bien. Y ahora me yo, toca a mí presentarte. Ah, Pero <risa> antes de presentarte vamos a poner un cortito clip dale, y dale. regresamos. Déjame entrar. 